The community of North Etobicoke is a, a perfect community to get involved with the Equal Just Food Network, um, especially uh, Rexdale, because we want to work closely with uh, marginalized and uh, and immigrant communities um, and incorporate them into you know a better food system. Yeah, definitely. And there's already a lot of great initiatives going on. Mm -hmm. So with that, hi, Andrew, welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the session. And as other people come, I'm going to let them in and they can join in the discussion. Um, but hello, everybody. I think we're familiar with one another for most of us. But if I'm just meeting you for the first time, my name is Katie and I'm with the Canada Africa Partnership Network. And we are a Canadian organization that facilitates partnerships between Canadian and African communities, and then also different communities uh, living here in Canada, and specifically in Toronto for this project. So this is this workshop is part of our Community for Climate Action North Etobicoke project, uh, which we're carrying out right now uh, with support from the Rexdale Women's Centre and uh, the City of Toronto. So. This is a project that uh, gives people as individuals and then also as community members pathways to get involved in climate Both, hi, welcome. Uh, in all of the areas that, that it's important to do so. So in the city of Toronto, our main emissions areas are in energy buildings, uh, transportation, uh, so, you know, transportation, fuel use, and then also waste management. So we wanted to put together this project um, that we can talk about all of those areas and then we can find ways that we can get involved in each of those areas. So one of the areas is uh, waste management and food. And uh, of course, that's an important one when it comes to managing food uh, properly and, and managing food waste. And uh, beyond that, we wanted to broaden the discussion so that we can talk about um, a whole food system and how we can start to build a more sustainable food system. So uh, Lily Fan is here with us today from the EcoJust Food Network um, to walk us through uh, a workshop on how we can build a better food system. So thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. It should be uh, a very lively discussion um, and Lily's got a lot of information to share with you um, about herself and her work and uh, about the EcoJust Food Network and how that started. Uh, so I'll just say, if you have questions as we're going along, you can uh, use the chat function, write them down there, uh, and then we'll pause for, you know, when it makes sense to have some discussion later on at the end. And I think Lily's got some questions to ask you too. So please use the chat function for that. Uh, and if you need to, you can unmute yourself and, and share out loud. So without further ado, let me introduce Lily. Uh, Lily is a beginner farmer with a goal of producing food for her local community while stewarding the health of the land and its waters. She is actively seeking ways to build human resilience in the face of multiple converging crises and believes that addressing the question of food is the key to any possible human future on a healthy planet. Um, besides her, her day job, Lily is also one of the co-founders of the EcoJust Food Network, and we're really pleased that she was able to make the time uh, to come and talk uh, with us today and to lead this workshop. So uh, without further ado, let me pass it to you, Lily, and enjoy the session, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much, Katie, and thanks everyone for taking time out of your long weekend to uh, to participate in this workshop. Um, when I had first scheduled it, it didn't even occur to me <laughs> that this was Easter Monday. So uh, I'm really happy that uh, that you're joining us today. Um, so first off, uh, I just w would like to know where every everybody is right now geographically um, and also you know if you want to write in the chat uh, not only where you're at right now um, physically but but where you came from uh, as well what your origins are um, uh, because a food system is so place-based you know I, I just like to get a sense of uh, who's in the room and you know what backgrounds we're all bringing with us. 
So I'll start off. Uh, I'm in Toronto uh, right now, Toronto, Ontario, and I came from uh, Vietnam. I was born in Hanoi, um, but came to Canada when I was very young. See, we've got another Torontonian coming from Mississauga. Katie's from Toronto. <laughs> I think we knew that. <laughs> Oh, Mongolia, that is quite a far way. Originally from Kitchener, now in the, uh, oh, orig now in Kitchener, but originally from Mississauga and raised in Toronto. Cool. So we've, it seems like uh, the bulk of us are in Toronto. So um, that's great because that will make this uh, workshop um a little bit more relevant to uh, to all of you. So I'm going to uh, start us off with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, though we're in a place uh, called Toronto, um, it is situated in the home and traditional territories of the uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit the Huron, the Wendat, and, uh, and more recently, the Haudenosaunee. And I know we all uh, call this place our home now, um, but uh, I do want to acknowledge though, that uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of our place in Toronto, um, that uh, we cannot truly call it a home until we can feel and, uh, and rightfully say that we belong. Um, and our only claim to home on this uh, territory is through the Canadian state. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the Canadian state uh, has not upheld his, uh, our agreements through the treaties that we've had uh, with the sovereign nations that uh, that call this place their home. And uh, if any of uh, you know anything about contract law, uh, a contract broken is, is a void contract. And so therefore, because we haven't honored our treaties, then, uh, then we cannot lay any claim to any title or benefit from those treaties. Uh, and I mentioned this not, um, not to bring us all down, but just to make us aware uh, of a uh, you know, of our situation here on this land and, uh, and also to point to uh, a treaty that is and, um, and has been upheld and therefore still holds power, you know, over this uh, area. And that's the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Um, I invite everybody to look that up and research it if you're not familiar with it. Um, but it is a treaty that was entered into by many nations um, prior to the Canadian state uh, um, coming into being. And it has been upheld since the time of its creation until now by those sovereign nations. Uh, and I, uh, I truly do believe that if we want in our heart and soul to be um, able to call this land our home um, with the same right as, uh, as the peoples of the sovereign nations of this land, then we too must uh, enter into the treaty um, of the dish with one spoon and walk that treaty, not only in word, but in deed. And so I, I invite everybody to um, read up on it and, uh, and choose to walk that path. Um, because of course, uh, in the work of the Equal Just Food Network, you know, we are embarking on our initiative in building a better food system in the spirit of the Dish With One Spoons Treaty. And so uh, we would like to welcome everybody <laughs> into that endeavor. Um, so I'd like to start off with asking people, you know, I know we're, we're all here um, to talk about how we can build a better food system, but I'd like to throw out this question to everybody and please in, in like a few words or less, uh, type it in the chat, your answer. Why do we need a better food system?
Because after all, building a, a whole system is quite a lot of work. Um, and we already have a food system. So why, why would we want to bother building a better one? So people are starting to type to restore human health so that everyone can have access. Now I'm assuming that means access to food. Uh, it is a big question, uh, but, it, but we need to address the why before we can go on to the how. Um, and so Aliyah wrote sustainability, resilience, justice, yes, uh, to build a local climate, resilience and food security. Uh, all very good reasons. Um, and I'm pretty sure if, uh, uh, if I asked that we would all agree that our current food system doesn't really address those in an adequate way. Um, so what do we hope to achieve, you know, um, through a better food system? Like what do we hope to achieve? And, and some of you have answered uh, that in your, um, in your previous answers, but to uh, I guess think more broadly, like, you know, what do we hope it to achieve by restoring human health? What do we hope to achieve, you know, through sustainability, resilience, and justice? Um, what do we hope to achieve by build, building local climate resilience? So again, just a few word answers in, in, the, um, in the chat. happy, healthy people, to avoid the wastage of food, and for a collective gain. So those are all the reasons and motivations why we would want to undertake such a, uh, a colossal task. Um, and especially for for ordinary people to undertake such a colossal task. I mean, obviously, if we were in the 1%, you know, with billions and trillions of dollars in the control of armies and economies at our uh, fingertips, it would be quite a, a, an easy matter um, to create a new system. And actually, um, the 1% does that on quite a regular basis. But for us, it's, it's not a simple matter. Uh, we're struggling, you know, uh, economically, uh, we're struggling with food insecurity, uh, we're struggling with our health, you know, so, so to undertake systems building is huge, um, but it doesn't mean that it is impossible. And we can break it down very simply um, in order to to make that process more clear for us uh, and to clarify the way ahead um, and to see where we need to, to go with it. So I would like people to um, participate with me in an exercise uh, and I'm going to share my screen. So this is uh, just a mural board. And I'd like to people like people to say out loud or type it in the chat, you know, what are the basic elements of a food system? And just toss it out and I'll I'll put it on the board. Okay, we have a couple responses here. Lily, do you want me to read them out? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so first we have soil, healthy soil. Always a good thing. All right. Next we have farmers and growers. This is coming in a good order. <laughs> farmers and growers, good one. Uh, consumers. Good one. Oh, no. Okay. OK. 
Okay. Consumers, water and seeds. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Brian. That's great. Hey, Tamar, welcome. Hi. So we're just going through elements of a food system for people who are just joining in now. So, so far we've got soil, farmers, growers, consumers, water, seeds, that's all good. Um, distributors. Transportation and logistics. Thanks, Andrew. Fertilizers. Excellent. And then health. Health in general. That's a good catch all one. Okay, there's more. Retailers. So that would include restaurants, grocery stores, and markets. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, government and policymakers. And nutritional content. Next one. Okay, let's stop there because we could go on all day. Yeah. Um, final, a final comment, fair wages for all. So I guess that that uh, touches on a couple of those farmers and growers and government and policymakers. So that's great, guys. Good job. I think you've thought of most of the most of the parts of the food chain there. So this is a good start. Now, some of these um, don't really have to do with the system per se. So, for example, qualities like health. Um, you know, are things, conditions that are obviously required for, you know, any activity to be able to uh, be engaged in sustainably over the long term and well. Um, other things like nutritional content or uh, fertilizers, seeds, water and healthy soil, these are all uh, requirements for growing, um, which obviously, you know, we need to be able to grow food in order to have a system around food, but it's not per se a systemic requirement. Um, various actors like farmers, growers, consumers, dis uh, distributors, retailers, um, and uh, I guess the transportation and logistics is a category of actors. Um, so all of these are different, yes, different elements of the food system. Um, but I wanted uh, to uh, engage in this exercise to one uh, kind of illustrate how complicated we can get with any food system, with any system, it can get uh, as complicated as, as we want to and as complex, actually. Um, and also how it can, um, when we're looking at things in their details like this, you know, it can easily uh, get overwhelming. Um, and, uh, and then we get pulled in, in a lot of different ways, you know, um, but when we're talking about starting a, a system, especially with uh, starting it from the ground up uh, on a grassroots level, uh, I always find that it's very helpful to try to distill things to their very essence. So at the very, very, very basic level, what are the things that makes up a food system? Uh, and I would argue, you know, that really all we need to make a food system are farmers and growers and consumers. And I don't like the word consumers because it's a very capitalistic term. Um, so I'm going to put eaters. We need people to eat that food. 
And all the other rest are what we do need eventually, um, but they support these two main, um, main basic elements. Does that make sense to people or like, I don't want to leave anybody behind. So, uh, <laughs> so if, if people are, are in total disagreement, um, I'm way off the, the, the ball, you know, please, uh, please say so or write it in the chat. Um, because obviously, you know, this is my opinion. Um, but I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm going to uh, assume that we're, you know, we're kind of in rough agreement. Um, so let's start there. Let's start with farmers and let's start with the eaters. Um, and let's bring it back to the real world uh, because that's where that's where we have to start from is where we're at and, and where we're, we're at is unfortunately in the very dirty reality of a COVID pandemic uh, in a time of increasing wealth and income inequality. So when we're talking uh, about eaters in the real world, um, we are talking about communities uh, in Toronto, such as, you know, Rexdale and uh, North Etobicoke, um, as well as, uh, you know, more in the eastern end of the city, St. Jamestown, um, who are uh, facing increasing food insecurity, um, not just because of COVID, but it has gotten worse due to COVID. So I so I want to introduce uh, um, St. Jamestown in particular because it's quite relevant to uh, the work of the Equal Just Food Network. Um, and I'll, I'll just describe the situation of St. Jamestown um, for everybody. Uh, so St. Jamestown is one of the, if not the densest neighborhoods in North America, um, I believe. I, I can't remember the exact number, but you know, the tens of thousands of people packed into a, uh, an area of a few square blocks. Um, if you walk uh, east of Young along, uh, along Carleton, you know, past Wellesley Street, you'll see, you know, um, an area that has just high rises, you know, built very close together. That's St. Jamestown, um, a very diverse community. You know, you have a microcosm of the world, you know, in that small uh, neighborhood. Um, I believe like, you know, just under 200 different languages spoken there, uh, a lot of uh, newcomers, you know, a lot of people who've been there for generations as well. Um, very quite diverse uh, in terms of not only origins and language uh, and age um, and so forth, but also a very uh, underserved and economically vulnerable population. And so uh, when COVID hit, you know, it really affected people, um, and uh, and and the levels of food insecurity are quite dire. Um, that community has been very active for the past ten years, at the very least, uh, in trying to uh, organize and uh, and build resilience um, for themselves, so, and they've achieved quite a lot, um, and they have over the past five years been working on a food hub. So to enable that community to uh, grow and process and provide for themselves the healthy food that they need. Um, so with the pandemic, they realized, um, well, a lot of their, their initiatives were ground to a halt because of the lockdowns and um, lack of resources and so forth. And, they realized that uh, they needed to basically up their game. <laughs> um, so that's in terms of the situation of, of eaters, you know, in our very simplified food system, you know, this is an example of um, a situation of an, of an eater 
right now in Toronto. Uh, with regards to farmers and growers, you know, for small and medium scale farmers, you know, the COVID also hit them quite hard. Um, and as a small scale newbie farmer, <laughs> you know, I felt some of that. Um, so farmers were, were hit in a myriad of ways. Um, a lot of farmers lost their markets, so they were uh, no longer able to sell their produce in farmers markets or um, or to restaurants because restaurants could not open. Um, and also because of the lockdown, you know, a lot of CSAs were struggling, um, you know, to to deal with the logistical challenges um, that the lockdown presented. Uh, not only that, but supply chains were also disrupted in terms of uh, supplies of like input fertilizers and, um, and so forth. And of course, the labor market was quite disrupted. Um, no matter what you may think about the temporary foreign worker program, it is a sad fact that uh, a lot of farmers do rely <clears throat> on temporary migrant workers for their labor needs. Uh, and because of COVID, you know, those workers were not coming through the border uh, in the numbers that were needed by farmers. Um, and then of course, you know, with the uh, quarantines and self-isolation measures and sanitation measures required, um, that uh, was a further block to uh, farmers getting the labor that they needed as well. Uh, so we heard from quite a few farmers that actually they had to plow under their their crops. Uh, it was not worthwhile for them to harvest it uh, because they had nowhere to, well, one, they had no one to help them harvest and they had nowhere to move the, uh, the crops once, once they were harvested. So in the face of rising food insecurity among the eaters, you know, as well as uh, rising unemployment among the eaters, you had huge amounts of food waste you know, um, on the side of the growers and a high amount of need for labor. <laughs> so it's, uh, so we looked at this situation, um, Saint, the, the community co-op of St. Jamestown realized that this was what was happening. And they called an emergency food forum last year in March, um, during which over 73 organizations attended. Uh, and out of the discussions of that, um, you know, the Equal Just Food Network was formed to try to match um, the needs of farmers with the needs of growers. Uh, sorry, not growers, but eaters. Um, and you know, that, that in a nutshell, when you are connecting people, you know, with complementary needs and challenges, you know, that's when you, uh, when you start to germinate the seeds of a possible system, because that's all a system does, uh, is, is meeting needs of disparate entities in a way that uh, benefits those parties and, um, and that facilitates communication and connection flows. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Equal Just Food Network. Um, so we started last year, late last year, after many months of discussion and planning and whatnot. Uh, and in the fall of last year, we were able to organize three farm work trips with about uh, five people per trip. Um, both because we were doing it on a small scale, but also because of the limitations of the lockdown. You know, we wanted to be sure that, you know, people were able to do so safely. Um, and it was done on a mainly ad hoc basis, uh, but the results were quite positive uh, and hopeful. The, the three farms that were involved, including mine, you know, uh, found those farm work trips really helpful in allowing us to get uh, the, the work done that we needed to have done. Um, and it was great for the community members involved who were in those trips, um, not only to get out of the city uh, and get up in, you know, out outside. Uh, it was really fun for them. They learned a lot. Uh, it was a, uh, a opportunity for, you know, rural farmers to connect with our um, urban dwellers 
back. So again, bridging, you know, those two worlds. And also people brought back with them a lot of produce that uh, otherwise the farmers would not have been able to move. Uh, so it, it benefited everybody and, you know, people felt uh, very hopeful <laughs> and uh, and we felt that, yes, you know, this could work uh, and uh, and we can scale it up. Uh, so that's that's our focus for this year is that we would like to scale up the um, operations. Um, so. Basically. Here is what we are hoping um, to do this year, to put it on a more systemic basis, but again, still focusing on those two core elements of a food system, the farmers and the eaters. Um, and, uh, and because St. Jamestown was the uh, community that kind of kickstarted all of this, you know, we're focusing on them for the time being so that we can have the um, the, the time and the space to grow and work out the kinks. Um, but we do want to expand it to other communities as well. And our focus, of course, being marginalized and racialized communities, because I, I really don't want to help the rich. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, so this is how we are uh, thinking of working this. So you have St. Jamestown Community Co-op. You know, they have their community members who uh, are involved in the co-op um, or at least, you know, have interactions with the co-op. So uh, they register, each individual re will register with the co-op for the Food Corps program. Um, that's what we're calling our initiative for the time being. And the, the co-op organizes all that registration and sends that information to the Equal Just Food Network. Um, the, at the same time, different individual farmers and food providers. So you don't need to be a farmer to be involved in the network. Um, you can be, for example, a cheese maker. You can be a bread baker. Uh, you can be a greenhouse grower. Um, you know, as long as you are in, in the, uh, the business of providing food and you need the help. So farm and food providers, you know, register with the food, uh, Equal Just Food Network. And once they're registered, you know, uh, a farm can request assistance from, a, from the food core. Uh, the food network will organize those food core teams and dispatch them to the individual farms uh, where they're needed, when they're needed. Um, and then at the end of the day, the farm will send back to the food network information confirming that you know um you know yes jim sally and uh ahmed you know came to my farm and they worked these many hours you know and so forth and uh, and then the food network will relay that information back to the community as well for their record keeping you know and then of course um the individuals will go to the farm that they have signed up for for the day you know and do their their work and have fun and so forth um so that's the very basic um flow of how we are envisioning uh this uh, rudimentary food system can work you know and of course uh, out of that as you know as more people get involved as more farm and food pr providers get involved you know then we may be able to expand that system um, and look at um, incorporating more elements you know like the distributors um, like you know a, a system of transportation um, that is uh, uh, more systematic and less ad hoc than what we're doing now um, we would be able to well we would love to be able to include in other policymakers on a municipal and provincial and federal level you know to uh, to help grow this system um, but for now you know because we're starting very small um, then we're we're doing it this way, you know, and just uh, gradually, you know, a seed doesn't grow in one day, nor do babies, and nor do food systems.
Does anyone have any questions so far looking at this? No questions so far. I think everyone's taking it all in, but I also wanted to say hi and welcome to Josephine. Thanks for joining us. Another member and founder of the EcoJust Food Network. Hi, Go Josephine. Ahead. Josephine, do you want to say something about uh, about St. Jamestown um, and the EcoJust Food Network? Just Are you muted? Okay. St. Jamestown has been working on a, I'll just put my video on, it's been working on a food hub model for a while. And we started linking with farms years ago and then um, had this forum where it turned into the EcoJust Food Network. And so part of it has been all still around how do we get more healthy local food into St. Jamestown. So we're really happy to see this um, growing and developing. And we do, we did ask our residents, our members, who would be interested in helping to work on farms. And 62% of our respondents said they were really keen to do that. So we can see that certainly in our community, at least, there's a lot of interest in being a part of the system and figuring out how we can connect the time and volunteer energy and track it all. It's very important for us because we want to value the work that our members do as well as the work that the farmers put in and be able to show decision makers, funders, you know, other food system actors what it really takes to involve people in the sustainable food system and talk about the kind of wages that people should be getting and things like that. So it's, uh, you know, it's exciting for us to see this evolving in this way. And um, we're really hoping to be able to get a lot of our residents out into the country. And what we are hoping also is that we can train people specifically to different farms or food providers so that they have a consistent crew that they can work with who knows what to do with them. So that's the sort of thing that we're trying to figure out. And we will hopefully have like a training that everybody who comes into the system gets around why agroecology is important, why healthy, sustainable food is important, how this connects to climate change, how it connects to indigenous and black food sovereignty, stuff like that. And um, that's something else that we're working on so that we have a lot of people starting to engage in the food system who understand you know, what kind of food system we're trying to evolve into. So yeah, we're really excited about it. Thanks so much, Josefina. You brought up a lot of uh, um, points that I didn't. Um, <laughs> because I, I thought, oh, let's let's keep it simple. But they, they are important parts. And I do want to emphasize them um, because I know uh, earlier on people were talking about healthy soil, uh, healthy food, and fair wages. Um, and that's something that we um, are tackling, you know, uh, with the EcoJust Food Network. Um, they're not simple questions to answer. Um, so we don't really have uh, answers right now. But uh, um, uh, Josephine alluded to, you know, valuing people's time. Uh, and I think I will throw it out now, even though it's, it's a whole can of worms in and of itself. But we are um, uh, looking at using time banking with the Food Corps program as a way to um, to get away from the volunteer model, um, because uh, you know marginalized, racialized communities are exploited as as it is already. Um, so we don't want to. Uh, foster a dependence on people's voluntary labor. Um, however, given that Canadian currency is not in great supply, uh, either for the farmers or for um, the common eaters of Canada, um, you know, we are exploring ways of using time credits or time dollars as a way to value, you know, the, um, the labor and time that people are putting into the farms. So that's a whole other schematic. I'm not going to go into it now uh, because we have 15 minutes left. Um, 
but uh, but if people are interested uh, in getting to know more about what we're doing and possibly getting involved in helping us build this food system, please do contact uh, contact us. Um, we have a website, and hold on. Yeah, and you might also be interested in the emergency food form where we're going to be discussing yeah. bigger issues as well as, yeah, everything, the micro to the macro, advocacy to action. <laughs> That's right. Um, so here is our website. You can go to equaljustfoodnetwork.org um, and uh, and find out more about what we're doing. Our website is constantly in development. Um, if you want to email us, uh, if you're interested in volunteering or being part of the Food Corps program, you can email us at equaljustfoodnetwork at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, and if you're interested in getting involved in the broader strategic conversations around food and food systems, climate change and agriculture, uh, as well as all of the uh, issues of justice and equity that intersect. Um, please do join us in the um, Emergency Food Forum. It's uh, scheduled for April 14th, 21st and 28th in the evening for, um, from 7.30, is it, to 9.30, Josephine? Yeah, I think we're just going to decide tonight whether we're going okay. seven to nine or seven thirty. Um, some folks, we've got folks leaning for seven, and some leaning for seven thirty. So we'll have to figure that out tonight. But we'll let you know. It's definitely Wednesday evening, and a couple of hours, and then we'll probably keep a space open for people to just dialogue also afterwards if we can. So yeah, we're just wanting to make this a really working session. It's not like you know all-star panels and you passively listen. This is if you get involved in this forum. It's because you want to be directly engaged in the work that is going on between all these different partners, organizations, and farmers and such. So really That's right. like active the food people. forum is not a panel of talking heads. Um, the food forum is, is a chance for people to get together to uh, organize and strategize on concrete things, concrete solutions that we can work on past the food forum. Um, and actually last year, you know, there were two, uh, um, two concrete things that came out of the food forum. One was the Equal Just Food Network uh, and the other was the open letter. Um, I'll let Josephine talk about the open letter. <laughs> Um, yeah, just briefly, you know, the open letter was drafted by um, a bunch of people and then we sent it out to all the people who attended the forum and others to get feedback and we came up with four recommendations and we've been gathering signatories of different organizations and farmers and the like. And we do plan to do like a public release right after the forum. So that'll be part of the planning discussion um, during the forum. And then we'll figure out how to basically challenge the government to address these recommendations um, in whichever way they can. And also the public to understand the importance of us transforming our food system and making it more inclusive and sustainable. So the open letter is kind of like an advocacy tool that any organization will be able to use if it's trying to get something done or a solution accepted or funded or whatever, the open letter can help back it up because it's full of what the governments are obligated to do and what rights and agreements the governments have made that would support a food system like this. So in a sense, it's like recommendations as well as why you governments are actually supposed to be doing this stuff. So kind of a handy tool. That's right. And uh, for this year in the Food Forum, we hope to um, continue those uh, those initiatives and uh, scale it up to the next level, um, as well as uh, strengthen the Food Forum collaboration itself, because what we're hoping um, with the Emergency Food Forum is that it becomes a, a collaborative um, platform for all actors um, in, uh, in civil society who are wrestling uh, with issues and concerns around food, around the environment, around justice and equity, um, and other systemic concerns uh, that intersect some way with food. Um, we've, uh, you know, we're all doing great work but we need to do more of that great work together in a um, 
uh, how you say a synergistic way and <laughs> coordinated way. So the food forum is a chance to 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 do that. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm done talking. And I see Tamar has turned on his video. So that's a signal for me. <laughs> Thank you all for um, <laughs> for paying attention and listening to me blab on for an hour about this. Um, I'm very glad that I've got uh, an audience. <laughs> uh, and I hope to uh, to meet uh, every one of you in the future, you know, as as we work together to make this world a better place. Excellent. Thanks, Lily. Thank you, Lily. Thanks, Lily, and thanks, Josephine, too, um, for introducing us to the EcoJust Food Network. And then before that, Lily, um, for walking us through the discussion on why we need a better food system. I think that's a great question to start with. Um, so maybe now we can take people's questions. Um, if anybody would like to know more about some of those details Lily's just shared and then Josephine added in on. Um, and or we could, I could start us off with one question. Uh, most of us are located in North Etobicoke. So what, what can we do, you know, for the next, hopefully we'll be able to get out and join you this summer for some of us. What can we do uh, starting today? What do you suggest? What are small ways that we can start um, working towards this food system we've imagined today from where we are in the city? Is that a question for me? Uh Yes, question for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, um, I believe the Rexdale Women's Center uh, is starting a community garden. Is that right? Um, so if, uh, if any of you are in the Rexdale or near the Rexdale area, I think that's a great place um, to get started if you're interested in uh, growing food for yourself, your family, or, or your community. Um, if you have any access at all to sun, uh, whether that's, you know, inside your apartment or you've got a small backyard or, you know, a porch or patio, um, container growing is great. You know, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities in the city to grow food, but there are some. <laughs> and container growing is the easiest one, uh, the lowest hanging fruit um, that you can achieve with regards to, to growing your own food. Um, and, you know, you don't have to grow all the food. You know, just, uh, just choose what you like to eat or choose what is easiest for you to grow um, and, uh, and start from there. You know, if you get a few neighbors together, um, then you can even coordinate, you know, maybe someone grows tomatoes and another person grows peas or whatnot, and then you can share your harvest. You know, that's, uh, those are really simple ways to, um, to tackle on a, a, a very small household level, you know, some levels of, of food insecurity. And, and of course, you know, um, you're tackling your own food insecurity in a very direct way that way. I think another thing that people can do from Etobicoke where they are is look around to see well is doing work around food, try to get, you know, in contact and a bit organized and see how you can support um, creating like sort of local distribution channels or whatever, see who in the neighborhood or in the area is, you know, more likely to be in need, how to involve them in it. You know that we've created this platform so that people can just keep adding on and adding in and being in touch with each other. We want it to be like the centralized organizing space. But also I think you know people can add their voice to the open letter, add support for it, um, you know, to raising awareness for their community, for co-workers, for local government or whatever about why we need to do our food system differently and use the open letter as a tool for that. Uh, it's another thing that is you know, easy for folks to do, I think. Um, yeah, and just get to know it. Look at the links in there so you understand what the right to food is about and how, you know, we're not just asking for favors. We're asking for things that government said they would do and that they're obligated to do. And I think that makes an important difference when we're doing advocacy. And I wanted to mention, like, the Emergency Food Forum is sort of a way in which a lot of different groups and organizations can amplify a common call for action without taking the personal or individual organizational risk of being sort of 
targeted for challenging the status quo in a sense. We were like trying to make a safe space for advocacy around the food system so that we can speak together. And I think that, um, you know, I've seen in the past in a number of times over the past decades that this could be sometimes just very, very important when we were trying to address, you know, big issues when we could do it together like that um, makes a really big difference and allows a lot more people to be involved together and support each other. So it's kind of, yeah, that's another way I think that folks can get involved as individuals or organizations or community groups or whatever. Well, if anyone is in the, or near the Al Albion Islington area, um, my uh, family has started way more seedlings than we can possibly plant. Uh, so we do plan on um, on selling, you know, tomato seedlings, uh, pepper seedlings, and so forth. So if you're interested, you know, uh, let me know. Um, you can uh, I'll I'll put my personal email in the chat. Yeah, and I, I'd be happy to hook you up with a, a few seedlings. Thank you very much. So we've got a little bit of interest already coming in there. So we'll hope to hear from you, uh, all of you who are interested in some of those opportunities and upcoming sessions uh, as well. Let me pass it over to Tamar now to pick it up from here uh, and wish everybody uh, again, thank you so much for coming and hope you enjoyed the session and found it useful. So over to you, Tamar. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank okay, you. Thank Bye, you. have a good day. Thank you, thank you, Katie, for for that. What can I say, Lily? It was indeed a comprehensive and very detailed yet informative session. I'm seeing where you know persons are quite enthusiastic about what is happening in terms of food security, and you know there's no denying it that you know especially in this pandemic, persons need to find creative ways and ensuring that there is a steady stream of food supply, whether it be at you know the local level regional or an international level and i'm sure that you know with this pandemic you know going from left right and center this is something that persons need to think about more yes i am living in an apartment or i live in a townhouse or i have a huge backland space what can i do what can i plant what is it that i can share with my neighbors i might not be able to grow crop a but i can grow crop b and that type of thinking, that type of creativity, that type of integration is very good. I really want to thank you, Lily, for the session. I enjoyed it. And so I'm sure that the other participants, too, would have enjoyed it. I'm happy to see you, too, Josephine. Um, we would have had some conversation, yeah, yeah. right? So I'm happy to have you here. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be posting in the chat a brief survey this is a survey that I am going to ask the participants to, to complete because it is important for our monitoring and evaluation purposes because we want to know how is it that we can strengthen these sessions going forward. And what we will do to Lily is that we will share some of the key findings with you mm -hmm. so that, you know, as you continue to conduct, you know, this type of workshop, this type of session, you at least have an understanding in terms of areas where probably you could broaden or probably areas that you might want to touch on. So I'm going to be sharing the result with you. So I'm going to kind of ask the participant to take us a few minutes, you know, after the session and complete the brief survey. Separating apart from that, I also want to bring to your attention some of the training that we have coming up here at Akai. So tomorrow we are going to be having the Rexdale Women's Center. They are going to be focusing on waste diversion education that's scheduled to start at 6 p.m. On the 12th of April, we will have Climate Fast with Colleen and Val, where they are going to be continuing their kitchen table conversation. And the focus will be on collective courage, climate education. Then on April 13th, we are going to be having AFD, which is the Africa Food Basket. And we are going to be focusing on balcony with the broad era being food security. And so you can see this type of integration. Lily was here today. And then on the 13th, we are going to be examining balcony gardening. On the 15th of April, Akai will be having their kitchen table conversation. 
and on April 19th, Cycle Toronto will be focusing on Cycling 101. Then we will have some bike repair sessions to be done at the Rexdale Women's Centre on May 3rd, May 10th, and May 17th. This information too is available on archive website. So I'm going to encourage you to visit the website so that you can register for this session because at the end of the day, these are our information sessions. These are our sessions that will help to promote and have implication in terms of how is it that we can contribute to ensuring that our environment is healthier. We have the type of food security that we need and ensure that we integrate and collaborate with different organizations. So I really want to thank you very much for taking the time out. I know it's, it's a public holiday in some countries here in Jamaica at Easter Monday, even though we are having a lockdown, but it, you mm. know, <laughs> that's what we, we, we have to get accustomed to it. But hopefully we can put that behind us. But nevertheless, I want to thank you all for making yourself available for this evening conversation. And we look forward to continue to have this type of discussion going forward. So thank you and have yourself a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Okay, great.